Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Meta Center Wednesday Talks. As always, coming to you from Soph and Tina. And today we have um, Venerable with us, Venerable Miao Yo, um, who's going to speak to us about the eight realizations of a bodhisattva and the relevance to our modern world. To me, that's such an interesting topic because, well, to be honest, it's the first time I've heard that there's eight realizations. <laughs> and um, I'm so keen to hear about how we can apply it in our everyday life. So, yeah, it's going to be a good session. Um, so a bit about, about our speaker, Venerable um, Miao Yu. So she's worked in the corporate and education sectors before ordination and later trained in the Chan tradition and humanistic Buddhism of Bo Guangshan Monastery in Taiwan. So since 2003, she returned to Australia as a resident teacher in meditation and conducted meditation retreats and CPD workshops at the Nantian Temple and the Nantian Institute. Um, Venerable is a director and company secretary of the Nantian Institute, responsible for its initial stages of development and construction. She was also a guest lecturer on at on Buddhist ethics for the Sydney Business School for MBA and ex executive MBA programs and many interfaith forums. She is also the Buddhist chaplain and contributed to the well-being programs in the previous Illawarra um, Reintegration in Reintegration Center in Unandura. Um, so today will be an interactive session as always. Um, Venerable will do a bit of meditation, introduction to the topic. And then Tina can jump in and help facilitate the session. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the session or at the um, Q&A session, please feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable to share your question with everyone, you could also send the, your question anonymously to Tina. Um, and this session will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. Without further ado, over to you, um, Venerable. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Sophie. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I guess we will start with uh, a very short session of meditation. And uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of the eight realizations. So, uh, yeah, it's my honor to be here tonight and um, lovely to see all of you. So, um, well, I guess um, we'll start with meditation. Um, we, we we probably wouldn't dim the lights, right? <laughs> For you? No, not not really. It's fine. Yeah, but people are all on that. It's it's fine. It's fine. Hmm. Okay, we'll start with taking a few uh, deep breaths. Yeah, breathing in and breathing out. And again. So wherever you come from, and just take some time to relax, and breathe in, breathe out, and uh, letting go. We'll start by noticing our breath, whether it's long or is it short. There's no need to judge how long or short our breath is, but just noticing. Just let ourselves observe the sensation of each breath as we breathe in and out. Just relaxing our forehead, our eyes and our facial muscles. Relax your jaws. Noticing any tension in your neck or shoulders. 
just breathing out and letting go. Neither fast nor slow. At your own pace, at your own rhythm. Take your time. Breathe in. Breathe out. And relax. Relax your body. Relax your chest and your organs. So sitting up straight. Relax your thighs, your knees and your legs. Relax your feet. Allowing any tension that you may feel to just melt away. Breathing in, breathing out. Letting go more and more. Now that you've taken a few minutes to relax and calm our body and mind, I guess we'll be more focused and stable and calm. So when you open your eyes, you might want to rub your palms together. And put all your eyes and absorb the warmth from your palm. I hope you are now refreshed mm -hmm. and we can start our discussion and talk on our the eight realizations of the great beings and the bodhisattvas, and how <clears throat> it impacts or the rele relevance um, of 
these eight realizations on our daily life. So I'd like to share with you that um, when I first went to the Nantian Temple, I, I, I wasn't a Buddhist. So I just came out of like curiosity and also I'm a tourist. Right? So I've never been to a temple in Australia. I've been to temples in Singapore, um, but I've never been to a temple in Australia. So Nantian Temple was really the first temple for me um, because all the temples I've been to in Singapore was just kind of like, um, what do you call those? Yeah, well, like the, the, the superstition or the maybe paganism or, you know, there, there, are, there are lots of other, other Buddhist sattvas or deities. So they didn't really attract me. Yeah. So I just go in and out. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not really a Buddhist. I'm a free thinker. I just think that um, I believe in spirituality and I believe in myself. So I'm actually quite an arrogant person. <laughs> so um, the, I tell you why the eight, the, the eight great realizations appeal to me. Because I think um, it appeals to a greater audience from all walks of life. So when I read these eight realizations, I feel that they, they are very practical. Um, so maybe we can share the first one. Uh, where do I go? Share screen. Next. Is it? Honorable, you're sharing screen at the moment. We can see the cover page. You can see the cover page, yeah? Yeah, I, I want to scroll down. Oh, there we go. <laughs> the first realization. All right, it's all about saying that the world, right? And we live in this world. Um, <clears throat> it's impermanent. Um, and things are always changing. Um, so uh, perhaps I should start how, how the sutra came about, right? The sutra came about uh, when one of the disciples, Anun, Anun, uh, Anirunda, uh, Anirunda um, asked the Buddha, how, how should the Bodhisattvas or the disciples of the Buddha and uh, sort of cultivate and become enlightened? And he was also very compassionate. He doesn't only care about the disciples and his friends, right? Who, who were the disciples of Buddha. He also cared a lot about the lay people. And so he asked the Buddha, how should we uh, ourselves, which means the disciples of Buddha, cultivate to become enlightened? And how should lay people become enlightened as well? So the Buddha said, wow, this is a very good question. And so originally this Sutra was meant for the disciples of the Buddha, but it's so extended to the lay people. So you see the first realization, um, the, the beginning of the sutra says that each morning and night, the disciple of the Buddha should recite and meditate on these eight realizations. So the first one being that the world is uh, impermanent. And that is saying that all regimes are subject to fall. So if we think about the world now, um, the economy, the government, right? And all the things that we lay people or not uh, are subject to all the changes, um, the COVID, right? So there was really nothing that was permanent. So how this sutra struck me was that I've always been a very um, so-called materialistic girl. <laughs> and um, security was very important to me. But on the other hand, when I first came to the temple, 
something held me back. Even though I was very materialistic, but I am spiritual in that when I first came to the temple, I, I started crying. I started uh, to feel as though I've come home. So I've come home to this place, a temple. So I must have some affinity with it. And so I felt like I felt so comfortable and peaceful, but I kept crying. So they were tears of joy, actually. I, I finally realized that I'm home. So the next three years, I spent more time at the temple than my home. So really, I'm, I'm single anyway. I mean, what's there at my home? Nothing, right? Because I, I didn't have anyone to come home to or whatever. So, um, and I really enjoy going to the temple. And I learned from many, many people, not just venerables, but people who went to the temple have a great affinity with me. And I felt like I'm part of the family. So <clears throat> this realization of the first realization saying that, you know, the four elements are empty. What does that mean? I didn't know what the elements were. Of course, we, I now, we all now know it's like air, you know, water, um, the fire, and the earth. But when I first came, I have no idea. But when I sat <clears throat> and read this sutra, the more and more I have uh, affinity with it. And I understand where all my troubles came from. So all my afflictions, all my troubles, and um, my unhappiness are actually from my own doing. <laughs> uh, but we see, we, we don't want, people don't want to acknowledge their own mistakes and wrongdoings. But I really, for the first time, I opened my eyes and look at myself and I knew that I'm not perfect, right? Even though I always thought that I was perfect. <laughs> uh, I'm one of those people who would argue to, you know, the cows come home to say, I'm right, you're wrong. So I understand now, like all the things that cause my suffering. So, you see, we, uh, the second sentence that says, we are empty of self without sovereignty. And we, uh, the body is the source of all confusion. The mind and body, we think in pure thoughts. And we sometimes even, is it me? Oh, sorry, sorry. That's my, okay. my apologies, everybody. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, so, Back to, to my, my, the relevance of this realization is that um, being a very materialistic girl, I spend a lot of time and money on my own body, you know, not other people, on my own body. And I, I have no idea about being charitable. So, um, so I'm, I actually am watching a very nice person. <laughs> I didn't think I was a good person or a nice person. Um, but I think Buddhism really point me to the, the right direction. It puts me on the right path. So I'm so grateful that I, I came across Buddhism because otherwise I, I wouldn't know um, what would become of me. Now, so the second realization is uh, about the desires, isn't it? Well, I have all kinds of desires, all right? So, um, <clears throat> the too many, too many, <laughs> too many, because it's like desires is a bottomless pit, you know? When you, when your desires doesn't come uh, the way that you like it, or when, when it didn't happen, you get disappointed and you get very angry. And so um, that's where my anger, my resentment, um, I have a chip on my shoulder. And, you know, that's why I'm saying I'm not a very good, nice person. 
So anyway, um, we go to that. Yeah. And so we have a lot, I have a lot of dissatisfaction in life, you know, because my, my, my desires uh, were not fulfilled. And so we spend a lot of time thinking, plotting, planning to succeed. So in the sutra, it says that you should be content with what you have. So it says that contentment cures greed. Compassion cures anger. So we are always confused because things we don't want and we, we're starting to plot more, scheme more, plan more. So all this uh, scheming and, and um, planning makes us confused. And that's why our wisdom will not grow because we spend our energy on the wrong things. So the, uh, the Surangami uh, Gama Sutra says that wise contents defeats the maras of the mind. So maras, maras are things that uh, sabotage ourselves, harmful things, you know, that sabotage ourselves. Um, <clears throat> The, the Supreme of Mindfulness Sutra says, if we have few desires, we would put away all the harmful clinging and we free ourselves from greed and desire. So another analogy that it gives is that we are like a fish that swallowed a hook. You know, you know how painful that is? So that that suffering will never go unless you know how to throw out the hook from your mouth, right? So therefore, you know, sometimes they say, no, no pain, no gain. Well, you see, when you take the hook out from the fish's mouth, it's painful. So, and I wasn't a very nice person because I'm always angry and always finding uh, fault because I only see the negative things and not the positive things. And so I need to build up compassion. I need to become more generous and more patient. So <clears throat> how would that... Um, that brings us to the third realization about being content says here that if you are poor of contentment, it's because you lack introspection. See, I wasn't very good at reflection on myself, right? See, my eyes is always looking at other people and not on myself. So for once, okay, I put, you know, the, the light onto myself. I put the magnifying glass on me so I can see why is that why why do I need to satisfy my needs why do people have to um, answer to me all the time so that's why I realized that I, I wasn't a nice person because I can't find contentment in what I have even though I have a lot already but I still didn't feel contented, you know, because I was greedy. But you don't know you're greedy <laughs> because you don't recognize it. And the next one, the fourth realization, it says that human beings are lazy. We are lazy and that causes our downfall. So we always want work smart right but we don't want to work hard we want so what is what is less is more do you think don't know so if i work less i have more time to sleep <laughs> yeah that is more but, but that doesn't make you very diligent person so what is my downfall see i don't recognize and i don't know that i'm lazy because I always think that I work hard. I, I'm highly functionable. And um, 
but I actually had depression and I didn't know that. Yeah, I was depressed for about 10 years, but I didn't know I was depressed because if you don't know, you don't fix it, right? So I didn't know I was in this very deep, dark hole. And that's why I was always angry. And when you're angry, you're depleted of energy. It makes you more depressed and more tired. So is this sutra, uh, the realization, the fourth realization helps me to see the kinds of Mara, my harmful attachments in my mind. So we all have attachments, but maybe they're not all harmful. Uh, but for me, I could see that I have some harmful attachments. I've got addictions. You know what's my addiction? It's shopping. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have so much of everything. <laughs> it's incredible. I, I've got my whole house is full of clothes and shoes and bags. And it's only one person in there. <laughs> I, I live alone. And so everything was all my wardrobes, my cupboards are clothes and shoes. So it took me months to give them away. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, that's addiction. But you don't think that as an addiction. And, and um, the wrong views, your, your desires. Um, I don't know if you can see. Yeah, the, the five aggregates, right? The five khandas or aggregates form, which is conceptual or, or, or physical, you know, looking uh, young and pretty and all that was part of my um, attachment, yeah? Um, perception, the feelings that it gives you, you know, for when you buy things, it, it's a kind of, a, I would say it's like a power. It's a power of getting something that you want and then you feel good for a little while. So what is the perception? Perception that, well, you look like a million dollars, right? For a little while, isn't it? But you see, the thing is, addiction is you crave it all the time. So it become more and more and more. So I, I was lucky that I I, I did earn a good salary, so I'm not in debt or anything, yeah? But, you know, for someone who couldn't afford it, and if you have that addiction, you, you could be in big trouble, yeah? Yeah. So, I mean, I was fortunate enough that I could afford it, but I was wasting so much money, yeah? Now I know how to use money, but before I didn't. I just wasted on myself. So what a pity. I hope I could live again, get all that money <laughs> and donate it and give it to the homeless people and all that, like what Meta Center is doing. Wouldn't it be wonderful? So you can see that I've got some harmful attachments and addictions that I couldn't see before until I came to the temple until I read this um, sutra of the eight, uh, eight realization of the great beings. And how did I come to read this? Is when I came to one of the retreats in um, the Tian Tian Temple. And we chant and we read this sutra of the great beings. And I think suddenly, a light globe turned on inside me and saying that, wow, how, how could this be? You know, is that me? <laughs> I, I suddenly recognize it. It's like suddenly the Buddha turned the light and the torch on me and I could see it for myself. And yet, even if my friends or my parents could tell me, I wouldn't, I couldn't see it. I couldn't recognize it. So this is the affinity I have with the Nantian Temple. It's 
actually saved my life. You know? So what do, what do I put it down to? I think at follows the next realization is my ignorance. So ignorance is like a light, isn't it? See that, and, and and in Chinese, the word ignorance means no light. <laughs> so when you have no light, you are ignorant. <laughs> in other words, no light, no understanding, because you have no understanding of yourself, and that's why we are ignorant. You want more and more, and you become more and more greedy. You don't get what you want, so you become angry. So all that stems from being ignorance. So what are the five afflictions in here that um, the sutra mentioned about the five afflictions? The afflictions are greed, anger, ignorance, which is what we call the three poisons, isn't it? And pride and doubt. Pride is one of the worst things because we have so much pride, we become arrogant. <laughs> and because you have so much pride, you hang on to your self-image and your um, sense of self, right? Which is all what fake. We have a false sense of self. And uh, um, so, so we wouldn't say that we are wrong. We wouldn't say that, oh, you know, I, I must have made a mistake. I'm sorry. You know, that's the hardest word to say. <laughs> And doubt what? The doubts are that it's about trust. You doubt yourself. You doubt other people. You doubt the whole world. You, you don't trust anybody. And so can you see how miserable my life is? Terrible. Right? Because nothing is right. Nothing sits right. So when you are unhappy, everything you see is dark. But when you're happy, everything you see is bright. And so <clears throat> if you haven't found or understood who you are, we go through a lot of um, self-blaming. You, you actually blame yourself as well, but you also blame other people because you're not getting your way. It's not that they're doing anything wrong, but you have to find someone to blame. <laughs> it, it's, it's quite crazy, isn't it? We live in a world that um, we're full of confusion, full of um, distrust. So if you look at the world now, you look at the government, um, the legal system, and the economy, you know, where's your money? Where's your superannuation? <laughs> Do you trust them? Where is it now? See, uh, interest rates going up all the time. Inflation. So there are a lot of ills or trouble in, 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 the, in the world, in society these days. But we need to trust that one day all this will be okay, isn't it? Because otherwise we, we can't carry on. So even though we have little distrust, but there must be a big trust, a bigger, there must be a bigger picture, a bigger a plan for us. You know? So we need to trust that somehow the world will be a, a safe place. Like we will have to have hope. And I think that's what Buddhism helps me to see that, yes, even though. In the past, I have a lot of wrongdoings, but I have to trust that I will work and get better myself. And that's how diligence can come in. Because 
You see, the transformation has to start from the self. You can't change other people. You can't change the world. But the only person that we can change is ourselves. And so I started to learn about the Dharma, <laughs> the Buddha's teachings. Um, we said that the Buddha is the doctor, right? And I'm sick. I'm a very sick person. So the Dharma is that that's the, um, the, the teachings are the medicine that I really need. And the Sangha members uh, of Dharma brothers and sisters, they will be the nurses that were so patient with me. And they're giving me doses of this medicine that I need. See, not too much, but not too little. Because if it's too much, I'll be scared, I'll be run away, right? Because it's that, oh no, this is too intense, right? <laughs> and if it's not enough, you wouldn't feel stimulated. So therefore, it has to be, it has to be the right dosage. Now, when I said I, I, I added something else, expedient means. Expedient means it's that sometimes we need to change something. You know, you, you can't be so, um, so restrictive. You know, sometimes they say uh, Buddhist people are really very dull. You know, they don't have fun. Um, they, they don't, they can't enjoy life, you know, and they don't drink. Um, so so there, there are lots of things that we can't do, right? Like the precepts, uh, you can't have fun, you can't sing, you can't dance, you can't do so, right? So there's sometimes the expedient means. And so um, we have to give people the right dosage. Yeah. Is that like skillful means? Or is yes, different? skillful, but yeah, it, it, in a way, yes, yes, skillful means. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so that you can see the circumstances and how that person can fit into um, this way of life and, and um, help them to understand. And when they understand it, and then they can let go of their past um, inhibitions or, or, or whatever. So yeah, it has to be probably skillful. And... <clears throat> And with me, um, I always have to ask why. <laughs> why? <laughs> so I have to curb that. Yeah. And then when I first went to Taiwan in Fuquan Shan, I have to stop asking why, isn't it? Because no one's going to answer you. Okay. And um, yeah, I, I, I learned, I had to learn very fast. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased that I persevere with it because um, being a monastic is, is not so easy. People think it's easy, but um, the truth of the matter is that there has to be a lot uh, of patience a diligence and learning a whole different culture. Yeah. So, um, and what's the sixth realization? The sixth realization is practicing generosity. So, you know, when you're angry and resentful, you are probably not practicing generosity. See? Because if you are patient, you won't be angry. No. And if you are forgiving, you won't be resentful. So none of those things I practice. <laughs> so I have to learn very quickly, <laughs> isn't it? Um, so the Bodhisattva says that you have to treat everyone equally, friends, 
and enemies the same. So do you think I can do that? Of course not. So I have the favorites, right? You have your favorites. I think we all have favorites. For me to curb that, I start with food. Because food is what you eat every day. And I try to have a non-discriminatory mind to be able to accept what I was given and be grateful that the food was here, somebody had to cook it, right? And, um, and someone had to deliver it. And all those people who put the food on your table. So I started to be grateful and thankful. And then, then I can appreciate. Um, so it was a very big learning curve, but I started to, to say, hey, you know, don't have your likes and dislikes. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. You should eat it because this person slaved in the kitchen for hours to produce this food. And that's how I overcome <laughs> myself from food. Actually, I'm a very picky person with food, but I learned to accept without question, without sort of saying, why is it so salty? Or is it, why is it so bland? Or why is it so hot, right? Don't, there's no why, right? Because the Buddha say, such is it, the, the suchness, you know, suchness. Tathagata, such is the way. So there's no why. It's a matter of fact. That's that's how it is. <laughs> so that's how I start to overcome my discrimination. I start to overcome my likes and dislike. And I start to uh, see people as like they're all the same. Like we are the same. We are all in a way interconnected. We're all in a way, you know, brothers and sisters in this global village. So I start to treat everyone the same. So people who just walk in from the street or people I know, you know, I, I try to be polite and I try to, to, to behave as though I know them for like for many years, but actually no, it's only the first meeting. <laughs> Sometimes people said, oh, do you know this guy? I said, no, I don't. This is the first time I meet him. <laughs> See, so it means I've been successful now, right? <laughs> Sometimes I say, oh, you know this man? I said, no, I don't. <laughs> it's the first time I met him. <laughs> but, you know, we can talk. So I guess, well, I'm doing something right. Mm -hmm. So, um, in a way, we, we get resentful because we are dwelling on the negativity of things. You know, we always look at um, the wall and we always find, say, oh, see, that's not perfect. There's a spot there that you missed cleaning or something. And um, so now I tend to see more in general you know, the overall picture. So I, I guess I have improved. So the other problem that we have is close-mindedness. What do you mean by being close-mindedness? We don't see. We only see what we want to see, right? It's being selective. And that's what we're close-minded about. We are only... We have selective hearing. <laughs> we have selective seeing. <laughs> yeah. So we are not open enough to look at the big picture. We only want to see what we see. We want to see. We only want to hear what we want to hear. And that can be an obstruction to our cultivation, obstruction to our learning, an obstruction to the Dharma, really. 
So we have to take everything and accept it the way it is. And that's being real. Ah, the opposite of anger and hate and poverty. What's the opposite of anger? Yeah, love. So if someone's angry, you show them love. You show them patience. And I mean, hate is a very strong word. I don't like to use the word hate. But there are some people who really hate something. I don't think they hate people, but they hate maybe the job. <laughs> I always say, find something that you like doing in your job. I mean, we have a job, which, you know, there are a whole list of things that we have to do every day. But surely there's something that you like doing. And so we have to find joy, joy in the things that we're doing every day. Then we can be joyful. Otherwise, we'll be angry and resentful every day. And it's, it's really hard to live a life that you are uh, resentful about. So the opposite of that is to show that you care. Show that, you know, you, even though you don't like it, but you do care about it. Because if I don't have a job, I wouldn't be able to feed my family or myself. So I have to care about my job. And even though I don't like it, I have to pretend I'm still liking it. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have a job. So that comes from gratitude. So if we are gratitude, there's nothing to winch about. It's because we are not grateful, we're not content. And that's why there, there's always complaints. So in a way, I learned uh, what you call even-mindedness. You know, you practice even-mindedness with whether it's people or, or your job or even like, you know, even toast, a piece of bread. You give them equal, like equal um, likeness. I, I don't like this. I don't like white toast. I don't like like, this, that, or whatever, but no, we have to accept. So we learn to accept when you give them equal value. That the value is that it will enable you to um, not get hungry. Okay? The toast or the bread will allow you to um, relieve your hunger. And, and that's equal value, isn't it? So it's not like or dislike. It's just they're all equal. So when we talk about giving, you know, because I'm a materialistic girl, um, I acquire a lot of branded goods and that. And then when I give away, you know what? I even discriminate when I give away. This is terrible. <laughs> what a terrible person I am. <laughs> I even discriminate. I said, oh, that person, no, she doesn't deserve my clothes. I have to give to somebody else. Yeah? So it was like that. So that's why it took me so long to give away my things because I choose the person I give to. So, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Um yeah, that's choosing too. Because like some people are you think they're more worthy uh to have this like more expensive uh jar or cutlery or whatever, right? And then these other people. Oh, well, you know, they're only uh, feeding the poor. They don't need, like, what is it, which wood or, <laughs> or, 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 or Douglas, what's the other one? I can't remember. Royal Dalton. 
Yeah, they don't need such beautiful crockery. So um, they, 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 they make do, you know, with ordinary things. So yeah, so that, that's also choosing. So the best way is to just like give way to Salvation Army or to whoever. And if you just give away, you're not choosing. The, the people you give to, you're giving to charity, right? And, and, and the people can choose their own product or the gift. So, would you say that perhaps there's a difference between choosing and discernment? So the example that's given now is yeah, it's not so much that there is a choosing of which one is you know, better in a, in a superficial sense, but it's a discernment. It's, it's a, a discernment to see with wisdom. With wisdom, yeah. yes. If I give to these people in need or I give yes. with this intention, it's better than giving to someone who either don't need it or don't appreciate it. Yeah. So that is in some ways a choice, but it's yep. more about discernment this, with uh, wisdom. Yes. Did you say so? Yeah. Yep. I would, yeah, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's not that they are more deserving of it, but it's about what they need. Mm. They did they didn't need more than this other person. Mm. Yeah, so yeah. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, in, in, in the Buddhist uh, sutra, they talk about the, the givings, the three types of giving, uh, giving material things, right? Uh, giving emotional supports. So um, you you help people to uh, relieve them of their you know whatever their, their, their grief or suffering you lend them um, you know a, a friendly ears you listen to them right uh, so that's emotional and they say the giving of the Dharma is the highest form of giving so because the giving of the Dharma enables a person to change their life, you know, just like myself. So I, I was able to change my life be because I came into the temple. And um, I had the support of all the, 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 the venerables in, in the Nantian temple. But if I didn't go to the temple, I wonder if I... At any state, I don't know when I would ever come across the Dharma. But the Dharma actually really changed my life. And so <clears throat> um, it, it's, it frees me. It liberates me from my afflictions and my suffering. So that there might be a lot of people who are in the same sort of boat like me <laughs> um, and we we can we can do it together in a way uh, we we will be able to um, look at you know what what our real problems are so a lot of people say that we have you know desires give rise to wrongdoings i mean if you so much want to be like rich and you go and rob a bank or something of course you know <laughs> that that would be a very simple example right of of uh, desires and wrongdoings but we actually do more day-to-day -day -day things that our desires and and make mistakes uh, that sometimes we don't see see um, and and that all arise from our discontents and dissatisfaction. Um, and and so, at the end of the day, the Dharma says that we we have enriched ourselves, you know, from our enlighten ourselves from our understanding of who we are. And if you really know who you are, you probably wouldn't need a lot of things to make you happy. And I, I, I think uh, with the monastics, uh, like 
I, I can't talk for everybody, right? I can speak for myself that now that I have reflected on my life like 20 years ago, so I've been in the temple since 2000 or um, I have a fair understanding of who I am, what I mean, and what I want to get out of this life. Yeah. So I think as a monastic, we all want to be enlightened. But you, a lot of people say, gee, enlightenment is a long way away. You know, it is, it is true. But at least for now, I am also, I free myself from a lot of my sufferings um, that I used to suffer before. So I would say that uh, the sutra here says that sentient beings, you know, we pass through. Oh, sorry. Did I? And, and because we, we have desires and we tend to dream about them and we cling on to them, and they say, because you are, your mind is so set on it, right? Even if you die on your deathbed, you be still, you might still think that, gee, I haven't done this, I haven't achieved this. So you come back to your next life, right? Your samsara, this is birth, death, and then you come back again, you get reborn. But in your consciousness, I guess those things are still there in your consciousness. So you come back and you still try to achieve it. So some people ask that, why do you think we keep coming back? Because it's life after life, right? Why do you think we come, keep coming back? And I said, well, I think we have unfinished business, <laughs> right? Unfinished business. So and that's why we, we come back again and again. And, but the Buddha says that if you have no more unfinished business, you can have no more um, desires that you want to achieve, like, then you don't need to come back. You can be enlightened. Yes, Sam, um, right? Yeah, you don't know? So here we are living in a society which is uh, kind of having a lot of sleep debt uh, in the modern world. Sleep deficit? Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> so how do we resolve this dilemma? Here we see a lot of people running around uh, with less sleep but then they actually need it. They need sense. it. Yeah. yeah. So is there any tips that you can give well, to the, the, balance the thing it? Is that when, when we, we say here one of the desire is sleep, is that people who sleep like more than 10 hours a day or they sleep, you know, all the time and, and not do. So for modern day life, we lack our sleep is because we are always on the computer, or the phone, iPhone, or whatever, which, which um, does something to our brain, isn't it? It doesn't allow our, our brain to rest. So, and that's why people have sleep deficit. Like, they want to sleep, but they can't sleep. But an, another thing is that um, in modern society, we work very long hours. So it, it taking away our rest time. So we, we're supposed to rest at least an hour before bed. But do we rest an hour before bed? Most people don't. Maybe, maybe you know, you, you, you all do. But I, I don't rest an hour before bed. I, do yeah, do nothing. And, and let the, you know, you, you should rest. Like let, let the brain sort of, you know, be like meditate for half an hour before bed. 
Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I I do meditation, maybe not half an hour, but maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Then I fall asleep anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mu music is 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 uh is a good kind of relaxation thing. Yeah. So perhaps venerable in that example, someone could be attached to sleep, but you, people can also be attached to busyness, for example. Yes. So they become so attached to busyness that then they develop sleep debt. A workaholic. Mm. Mm. Yep. Busyness, um, because they feel like they have a, they want to achieve. If they don't achieve, then they feel that they are inadequate. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, I find that people have 10 hour shifts and one hour each way. So it's like 12 hours of my day work. Mm -hmm. So when I get at home, I feel like I need to do something fun. Yeah. And so by the time I cook, it's already really late. So I want to, you know, watch something, do something, and maybe play this fun, trying to fit it all. And in by the time I look at the time, it's like, oh, no. It's midnight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got five hours, and I don't start it all again. And that's my, like, I have the desire to, give myself time for myself. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes, yes, it does, definitely. Yeah. Mm. And I want to get more into like meditating again, which I used to do when I it's very tricky when those desires play out. <laughs> yes, yeah. desires the desires to play the guitar well, yeah, or, or or have some fun. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I'll do all at the same time and I'm not actually happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to do this. No, I want to do that. No, I should eat. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad you made it to today's session. Yeah, I, okay. I, I, I guess it's a matter of like your priorities. Yeah. So I think you give yourself um a list. Okay, today I play the guitar. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow I'll cook. All right. I think if you if you think cooking is fun. Um, because I like cooking. Um, if um, what else do you do? Uh, watch a movie or something. So, so you can still do all that in a week, but not on the same day. <laughs> yeah, give give yourself some priorities and say, okay, today I do this, tomorrow I do that, and so, so you list it out. Mm. Yeah, one of them has to be meditation. <laughs> So you just, you need to give yourself some time just to kind of let everything sort of rest. Um, so I, I guess 15 to 20 minutes, yeah. So, yeah. So I, I, I call that greedy. Because <laughs> we are greedy. So we're greedy, we want everything. And, but we know we cannot accommodate everything, but we still try. And so at the end of the day, who suffers? Your body. Mm. So if you acknowledge that your body suffers and you know your body suffers, you can do something about it. But when you don't know or you ignore it or you pretend it's not there, that's when your body collapses. Mm. I actually had, um, I, I suffered for that like, depression, but I also had um, chronic fatigue syndrome. Oh. It's when your body refused to do any more maintenance work for yourself. Because the body says, your life is so miserable, you know, you might as well die. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's what it says to me. I think you, your life is so miserable. I think you should just die. <laughs> mm. And um, yeah, it took me a long time to get back, to get back to living a life that I can enjoy. And I think what changed it and brought me, you know, out of this dark, deep hole is Buddhism. Finally realizing all the things that I've done were my harmful attachments. They are the things that they could, you could say they're the maras of your mind that holds you, you know, and you, you kind of uh, 
um, imprison yourself, you know, in in the in the in the in those five aggregates, because it's all to do with the desires, and and you make excuses for yourself that why it's necessary, but actually it's not. So the eighth one is about the world is not infinite, you know, because if we start abusing it, just like your body, you start abusing it, it's going to collapse and, and it's gone. You die anyway, but the world is the same. So maybe what, 200 years ago or how many years ago, you know, when we started to, uh, to know that industrialization uh, can bring prosperity, you know, to people, to the citizens of the, of, the, of the world, and we start producing and we think that, oh, of course we will get water. It's always going to rain, right? We're always going to get crops or you're always going to get this air the fresh air, but we don't. See now, pollution and everything is really taking our health away. It's, it, it's, um, it's making an a adverse impact on everyone, you know, young and old. And so that's why the awareness that the whole thing is birth and death, you know, fire, it's raging. It is really raging because if you look at the world today, the climate, climate change is so hot. It's, it's all the disasters, like the flood, cold, you know, famine. It's going to be hotter. Uh, they say this year we're going to have very hot summer in Australia. So we're not I'm not looking forward to it <laughs> and um, you know that everything comes to an end and that's why the Buddha said the world is impermanent all things are impermanent right we are impermanent right? life sickness death and then we'll come back again and hopefully we learn from our mistakes hopefully we understand where, um, what the mistakes we made and we will do better next life <laughs> if we come back again. So as you can see, what causes um, uh, all, these, all these things that's happening in this world have an impact on us, you know? So, do you think we are better for, for it or worse? Is, is society taking these lessons um, and, and, and we want society and, and people, like human beings, learned from the mistakes of the past and we want to change? Uh, we want to amend our ways and make it a better world. There are always two sides to a story, isn't it? Most of us want a better world for ourselves and the future generations. Yeah, But there are some people who want to make it a better world Perhaps not for the general public or the greater good, but for themselves. So I'm referring to the people, the fraudsters, <laughs> the scammers. Huh? So they want to make it better for themselves, but not necessarily for the better world. Not, 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 not for the whole world. It's just for themselves. So, <clears throat> and then um, these days, because of technology, it's much, much easier to, to uh, def defraud, to commit fraud, fraudery, uh, to commit, you know, uh, to, to scam or to do whatever. And so you can see that 
the world is not always a very nice place. And so that's why we need to make a better world for our future generations. So what do we do? We start with ourselves. So compassion starts with ourselves, our family. So sometimes we are less than compassionate to ourselves. It's easier to be compassionate to other people. It's very difficult. I'm not, I wouldn't say it's difficult, but we, we tend not to do it. Right? We tend not to do it. But when we know that we're bashing ourselves up and then you say, why did I do that? <laughs> right? Because we tend not to do it. We, we tend to put ourselves last. So we need to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of our family. Um, and if you look around yourself, our world, and it's really, um, it, it's really a, um, you can say, is the, is the impact or the result of our own actions. So um, if you look at my own world, like what I've done before, um, all my suffering was a direct result of my own actions, of my own thinking, of my own doings. Yeah? And now that I've changed it around, and I can also see the impact and the result of my good actions, so, you know, karma, what goes around comes around. And it really is, it stems from our own actions. So the Buddhist teachings advocate self-responsibility, self-education, and self-actions. So without, if you don't take responsibility for your own action, who did it? You know, a lot of people say, oh, you make me very angry. I say, did I? <laughs> See, about self-responsibility, you know. Did I? Oh, I'm so sorry I did that. I didn't. You see, it's about self-responsibility. So, um, and I guess that, you know, we always have to be prepared for the worst. But on the other hand, we have to develop some sort of positive um, actions, right? So that we can have hope for the future. So we know that this action that I'm doing now, perhaps, uh, well, we hope that it will go a long way, but it may not. So we can say that we hope for the best, but we also be prepared for the worst. Does that make sense? Yeah. We, we, we hope for the best, but we need to prepare for the worst. And I think that goes for um, everything in life. You know, whether you have a sick relative or you're sick yourself, <laughs> and you prepare for the best, but sometimes you also need to prepare for the worst, yeah. Um, your job, you don't know when you're going to say, you know, we don't need you anymore, right? So that's suchness again, you know, that is life. Um, <clears throat> what I enjoy out of my life as a monastic is that I'm able to build affinity with people that I don't know. Um, I always think that it's a challenge to talk to people that I don't know. <laughs> um, and um, also to listen. So one of the joys I get from my job is um, when we run the meditation retreats. So I get like 20, 30, 35, whatever number of people we get. And each one of them has a story yeah? and um, it's really quite a privilege to listen to their stories. Um, so that they are the joys, you know, about learning and listening 
And there's so much, there is just so much in this world that uh, we can learn if you are prepared to listen. Mm. So caring, being compassionate, uh, forgiving, kindness, now all those are virtues that we need to cultivate and acquire as a human being. Um, <clears throat> It's, it's more important than anything else. It's more important um, than to achieve happiness or joy for yourself. Because when you are caring and you make other people happy, then happiness will definitely you know, be on your doorstep. Because you can't help it but be happy at the same time. So I think you know, what you give, you get back in a hundred folds or a thousand folds. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess another difficult thing that I learned to do as a monastic is about developing equanimity. So what, what is equanimity? We don't often use that word in the normal sense of like everyday life. But we read a lot about that in the Buddhist teachings. So for me, I think equanimity for me is accepting. Accepting others. Even though you don't agree with them, but you accept that that's their view. And when you accept, then you can embrace the differences that you and the other person have. And you also will be able to see that, ah, you know, you put yourself in the other person's shoes. Mm -hmm. And um, so it is with understanding. And then you can have peace in your life. Because if you don't accept, and when you don't accept something, what does it do to your heart? You know, your heart aches. Huh? <laughs> so when your heart aches, there's no peace. And so you accept because you know that that comes from a different worldview. And it's okay. It's okay that you don't agree with them, but you accept. But then you can have peace in your heart. So, in the end, conclusion, I think we all can diligently practice the Buddha's way and cultivate wisdom through the eight realizations. So the eight realizations are there to awaken all of us and liberate us from samsara and to turn away the five desires to cult and cultivate our mind on the noble eightfold path. So the Buddha, that's that's why the Buddha advocates that you know we disciples of the Buddha recite on these eight realizations day and night to steer us away from our afflictions and so that we can make more wisdom to be enlightened. And Okay, this is mine. That's what I take away. All right, can, can you all read that? It's a bit small, isn't it? Yep, thank you. Mindful meditation raises awareness uh, of the ills of the modern world. So what do the modern world have? Modern world, impermanent, instability, you know, change. And um, <clears throat> we are all imprisoned in the five aggregates, which give rise to desires, greed, anger, illusions, suffering of self-image, pride, wrong views about death, laziness. And the hindrances is that we are restless. Because if we don't get what we want, we, 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 are, we get restless. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm saying that the practice of humanistic Buddhism and um, will sort of cure us <laughs> to, uh, 
to the Buddha's way. So humanistic Buddhism will have human connection and we can build good affinity, compassion, loving kindness, patience, and really be real uh, and know ourselves, be authentic. So it says the three acts of goodness, think good thoughts, say good words, and do good deeds. And the four givings is to give others joy, hope, faith, and confidence. Um, be of service to others. So and that's also a part of giving. Eh? <clears throat> and the Buddhist way, at the end, if we practice all that, we will get contentment, joy, happiness. And we learn to be generous and hardworking, to be diligent, authentic, mindful, forgiving. We have a calm and stable mind. And we be wise. We have equanimity, peace and harmony, compassion and love for all. So with this, I'd like to end our um, awareness on this eight realization. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. So before we transfer merit, yep. we <laughs> do have questions. And if anyone has any other questions, just pop it into the chat or you can ask it if you're here in person. And also for the sutras that we talked about, the sutra that we talked about today on the eight realizations of the great beings, I've actually popped that into the chat. And if you're watching this on YouTube later, we'll also put it in the description below as well. So enjoy. Okay, so then yeah. we have some questions. Okay. Okay. Thanks. The first is this, um, how do we work with affliction of doubt? How to build more trust for oneself? Well. It's a hard one. Mm -hmm. Actually, I learned trust. I, it took me 40 years to learn trust. <laughs> only. I just can't. Yeah, only, yeah. <laughs> Be, because um, trust is something that, distrust is something that you learn. Mm -hmm. If you are not sort of grow up in an environment where trust is shown to you, you 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 will be distrustful. Mm. You don't trust people because you've been played out all the time. Mm. So I I I don't know um, the situation that you know uh, this person that asked the question where where are you from or 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 what sort of um, conditioning you get. The the family that I was grown up, um, they don't they didn't show me trust. So I, I was, um, I wasn't abandoned, but I was kind of like, you know, passing the ball kind of thing from here to there, to there, to there. So I, I never learned. Um, so I wasn't really, what is that bonding? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I never learned to bond with anyone. Mm. And that's the reason for my distrust of people. And then when I trusted the person, that and then they finally kind of disappoint me and then I learned to say no I, I cannot trust other people so therefore the only person I can trust is myself so it takes a lot of courage to trust mm -hmm. okay? and um, and I've been played out a few times but then I have to tell myself that not everyone is like that you know, so the first person, why why do you not trust people? Firstly, is because you don't trust your own judgment. Mm -hmm. that can can I can I say that? Yeah, you don't trust your own judgment because you've been played out so many times. Then you said, "Gee, I can't trust my judgment," so therefore you stop trusting uh, everyone. Mm -hmm. So that's why it took me a long time to trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a follow-up question, follow question? So, uh, you know, it took you a long time to come to this balance. Yeah. Right. Uh, so mm -hmm. how do we, uh, can you share some tips 
for us to expedite us. We don't want to do another 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> they say Rome's not built in a day. <laughs> um, I, I guess I took baby steps, you know. That's why it took me so long. But if you are um, truthful to yourself, okay, if you can really open your eyes and look at yourself and uh, not kind of scream and sort of like, oh, I don't like what I'm seeing. I'm going to not, not see it or, you know, pretend it's not there. Um, then you will see your, you will see the mistakes that have been made in your life. And then you can start to make amendments, amend your ways. And then it goes back to the precept, which is being honest to others, I think more important than one to oneself. Yes, I, I think that is the criteria for actually looking at yourself and understanding uh, yourself. It's easy to look at other people. I mean, I, I always look at others, but to really look at yourself uh, needs courage and needs your own, uh, your honesty. Honesty, yeah. So honesty, integrity, all that. And there's a level of vulnerability to it as well. Yeah. You know, whether it's vulnerability in terms of looking at ourselves or vulnerability being able to trust others. And yeah. as you say, it takes a lot of courage then to mm. be vulnerable in that state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for me, when I overcome this is I, you know, I, I do a slow walking meditation. I do it like the, like the, um, it's, it's not our, our Chan school. So um, it's the Taravadan school, that very slow one, okay? So when I do that, don't you make yourself vulnerable? Because when you really do very slow walking meditation, you are balancing on one foot, yeah? So one foot. And then the other foot is in the air, okay? <laughs> and that's when, where, where you, can, you can tip the, that you can fall, right? because you don't hold yourself properly. So that's the vulnerability. And I always remind myself that, yeah, for us to move forward in life, you need to be vulnerable, to allow yourself to be vulnerable. And if you don't put your foot forward, let's say you are too scared to move on. So, that is the stuckness that you will feel. You really feel stuck. And that's a terrible feeling. So that, that stuckness is where most people who are too afraid to take that leap. So I have to move from stuckness to suchness. <laughs> yes, to suchness. To, to, to acknowledge that, hey, I'm not perfect. Yeah, hey, I need to amend my ways. I, I need to change the way I think because you see, most of our problems come from negative thinking because mm. we are so negative about the world, about ourselves, about everything and that we, we um, imprison ourselves and not, not take the next uh, step forward. So if we don't try, we are never going to know. Mm. Great. Yeah. That's an excellent answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> now we are out of time. We're about to be out of time. But just one last question. It's okay. Which is quite a big question. But it's this. <laughs> okay. Or maybe it's not. I don't know. Maybe. maybe for you it's an easy breeze. <laughs> uh, you were talking earlier about unfinished business. Yeah. So the question is, does a bodhisattva have any unfinished business? And if not, then will a bodhisattva come back again and again? Well, the bodhisattva is in the stage where he, where he or she is the bodhisattva, right? And so they, they, their business is to liberate other people, is to help other people through their suffering. So they are there, they're stable, and 
um, their aspirations to help others. They have no aspirations for themselves to be a Buddha. And that's why they remain as Bodhisattvas. Just like Avalokiteshvara or the uh, Siddhigaba Bodhisattva, they're there and their whole aspirations is to help other people. Okay? They, they're not like us. Bodhisattvas are not like us. We, we're humans. <laughs> so humans, we're not perfect yet. And that's why we strive to be more, uh, to more wise, to be more perfect. And we think that when we are perfect, we become Buddhas. And so this is like, um, this is our aspirations. <laughs> so we still aspire to be better, right? Whereas the Bodhisattvas, they are very contented to be there. And the whole, the whole idea about being a Bodhisattva is that they are able to help other people to liberate these people of their suffering. You know, whether they're in the hell realm, like Siddhigaba, or um, in the human realm with, you know, Avalokiteshvara or Shuri. Or, uh, mm -hmm. And the second part of the question, um, if they do have unfinished business or they're still around, mm. um, will they come back again and again? The Siddhigaba, uh, you Obviously mean the Bodhisattva? Bodhisattva? Mm. Yeah, they will remain as bodhisattva because when they are bodhisattvas, they are already out of the cycle of birth and death. It's only um, the six realms, you know, uh, mm -hmm. human, uh, heavenly beings. They are they can still subject to birth and death. Whereas we are bodhisattva, and you're just below the Buddha uh, realm. You you will stay there unless you want to be a Buddha or uh, earn enough merits to be a Buddha. But I think most Bodhisattvas just want to be there to help others. Right. So I think that's, that's my understanding. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Ben. Oh, thank you. Excellent session. I'm going to pass it now over to So, Sophia. Thank you, Venerable, for this very, very wonderful session. I so thoroughly enjoyed it not just in the what you taught, but also the way you taught it with much lightness and suchness and uh, lots of wisdom communicated in very simple and relatable stories. So yes, very enlightening. Thank you very much. No pun intended, maybe a little bit. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> um, so um, would you like to do a prayer or dedication of merits before we finish off the night? Oh yeah, sure. I've got one here. Can you see it? No. <laughs> we stop sharing screen. <laughs> Would you like okay. to share screen again? <laughs> oh, yep. Can can you see the screen there? Yes, mm -hmm. we can. Okay. So, um <clears throat> thank you thank you all um for inviting me here to Meta Center for this session. So, I like to um read this aloud and we all can read this aloud may kindness compassion joy and equanimity pervade all worlds may we cherish and build affinities to benefit all beings may chant pure land and precepts inspire equality and patience may our humility and gratitude give rise to great vows so thank you very much for uh, joining in our session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Venerable. Hi, Sinsin. <laughs> I finally saw you. <laughs> yes, Venerable, thank you. I was able to join the session finally. So I'm glad I did. <laughs> ah, yeah, you've been very busy, huh? <laughs> yeah, thank you. So was there any other questions? Here. Yeah, just some quick okay. announcements. Yeah, so next Wednesday on the 5th of July, we have Nyun Trung Kong um, talking about Brahma Viharas as taught by the Buddha, a sutta based approach from 7 to 8 30 again. And as always, we have Meta Convention coming up and we have um, our Meta Connection that's just being launched recently. So, um, mm -hmm. 
if you're interested in those things, please um, message us um, as well. Um, and yes, noting we're already over time. Um, I might let everyone off for a great night, unless if you have any yeah. questions. I think Venerable is still here for some questions. Recommend Venerable's retreats at the Nantian Temple. Do you hold retreats too? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. still oh. hold retreats. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, every month, is it? Is it a um, we have at every month, but we have about two a month. Two, two a month. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah, we have one day retreats and we have two or three days once as well. Yeah. So I just finish one in the weekend. Oh, wonderful. Uh, it's a it's a two day retreat. Yeah. And we got about 30 people. Uh, one of them was as young as 14. And she wanted to come with her mother. Uh, she was a very mature 14 year old. Mm -hmm. um, so because it's uh, only kind of like weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like five days or 10 days one. <laughs> so uh, and, and the, the 14 year old kid was able to join in everything and she was very serious um, in, in meditation and um, she didn't move like we, we, we meditated for about um, it's, it's a guided meditation so we did probably 10 minutes of guided meditation and then 15-20 minutes of actually just sitting yeah, and she was there the whole time hmm. She didn't like move or or go to the ladies or go to the toilet or you know you know sometimes kids do they they feel a bit restless yeah and um, I think she 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 did really well I said I was so proud of her <laughs> and um, and uh, there are quite a lot of mothers and fathers there right and then they said oh well you know next time you should run like a kids retreat <laughs> and they want uh like child and parent interaction so the 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 parents come to and then they do it together and i think oh that's that's a great idea actually um so there'll be more parent interaction with the kids and they say that actually at home they don't spend much time with the kids mm. yeah and so in um if we do that sort of um, events so they will be, they have more time with the kids and they also will be able to find out more about their children. But otherwise, you know how children sometimes don't talk to their parents. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think that's, that's a great idea. So we'll think about it. But I said our, um, this year's our timetable is very busy. So we, we, we might think about it and we can do it next year. <laughs> Yeah. yeah thank you yeah thank you i'm very pleased that i able to to be here today and um and and share with you um my life's journey <laughs> <laughs> so this is where i'm at now Aww. but we don't know what's gonna happen next <laughs> so thank you yeah thank you, thank you.